right. Welcome back to the Board Drill Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Kyle. With me is my co-host, Matt, who I'm going to scold real quick um, for a quick reason. We actually did an episode last week. I asked Matt multiple times to finish his upload, and he didn't do it for me. So, Matt, I'm a little mad at you. Texted you twice and emailed you. You got to finish your upload because we, we couldn't post the episode. It's your fault. Never got the email. Yeah. So Matt's a liar, in case you're wondering. Uh, no, no, let's, I'm just let's stop. Hold on. Let's stop right now. <laughs> let's stop the episode. No, I'm saying, like, let's – I did, I checked the email. I didn't <laughs> get an email. We're not stopping the episode. We're going. So it's uh, it's okay. There was it's no not a email. big deal. There was no email. I checked. No, and, and here's the reason. I'm getting mad at you because I got chastised today by – I got chastised today by a coach texting him, and he this was the exact quote he gave me. What are you scared to do the podcast because Florida State's zero and three? You want you want you don't want to show your face? And I was like, first off, I don't give a crap. Second off, you're a Gator fan, so you're in the same boat as me. <laughs> um, all right, so let's get into it uh, real quick. If you're listening, sorry for Matt and me bitching at each other right there. Um, but again, make sure you're checking out uh, boarddrill.com for all of our articles that come out weekly. Uh, cut ups, all that good stuff on YouTube. We're doing a massive amount of cut ups, um, a lot of NFL stuff, a good amount of college stuff. So uh, check out that. Make sure you like and subscribe everything. Follow us. Subscribe to boardrill.com. Uh, just make sure you keep it up with our channel because we are we're posting an excessive amount of uh, football content this year. It's been really fun. Um, our TikTok, Matt, has blown up. We've gotten 33,000 views in the last 20 days. So it's been pretty cool. Um, would you like I've to just take. That. Sorry, there's go ahead. More and more likes for every video. There's more and more likes. So it's good to see. Yeah, it's good to see. So, would you like to take a guess at which clip of what football game has our most producing likes? It's not one you would think. You didn't put uh, two of getting concussed up, did you? No, no, I wouldn't put anything like that. It is a college football game, and it was an upset. Any guesses? Notre Dame game. It is Maybe the Notre that, Dame that one, game. The, yeah. <clears throat> it is the wheel out of the backfield, right? They wheel. Yeah. really, really cool play. They're they're if you're listening, they're basically in trips with the Y and a wing. They motion the Y in jet motion and give a really good jet fake. And the running back who set weak runs the wheel out of the backfield and they hit him perfectly for a huge gain. It's early in the game to help give them that big lead. Really cool play. I've never seen I, I'll be honest with you, as a DC. I've never seen anybody put the, the Y off in jet motion, even to fake it. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is kind of cool. So pretty good play. Um, that's our top like one on TikTok, so that's good. Matt, let's get into the episode. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, the fun thing about football TikTok is you just get to see plays. Yeah. You know, you can just swipe through, and you, once you start following these football accounts and it knows you're looking for football, you can just pretty much swipe through and look at plays, plays, plays. So. You know, as long as you stay on your that algorithm and you, you you buck all the other stuff, man, that's it works out pretty well. Yeah, no, it's it's fantastic. I know Twitter does that as well. Um, but really, Twitter, I want to hear like discourse on coaches. TikTok, I go there just to watch plays, like you said. So, you know, it is what it is. Everybody does different things, but that's what we do. We just post the plays. That's it. No, no discourse or anything. Um, all right, Matt, let's get into it. Preseason polls suck. They suck in the NFL. When I hear people talk about who's going to be good, they suck in the college game when they talk about who's going to be good, and this has affected me multiple ways, but uh, is it time to get rid of preseason polls? They're terrible. The, the sad part <laughs> is they never will because it's up to the AP writers. You got a bunch of writers out there that, that don't pay attention to other teams in the off season, what's actually going on. And, um, and they have to know, make they, content they, and they, <laughs> they got to make content. So they're, they're, you know, they're, they're never going to go away from that. And uh, they, they find pride in doing that. Uh, I don't think that it should be used the way that it's used. That, oh, Correct. They, you know, they beat a top 10 team according to who, according to what. You know, th- it doesn't matter. <clears throat> you know, until you put results out on the field and you start playing these conference games, um, you know, I, I'd say they shouldn't be ranked until four weeks in. You, well, know, that, I, that, you know, there should be a ranking that doesn't involve writers, first of all, because – I don't really need to listen, like you said, to the beat writer for, you know, Cal on his opinion on football across the country and vice versa. The beat writer, you know, LSU that only watches SEC football and everything's garbage to him. And, you know, so it's I'm with you. They just need to say, like, look, we're no no poll is going to come out that affects rankings and bowl games or playoff until week six. That's what I wish they would do. 
Like, look, you can do your little make believe polls and all that stuff, but nothing that affects the game until week six. Because like you saw, look, and my team's the guilty one right here, right? Florida State was ranked number 10. They're 0-3. They just lost to Memphis at home. Like, guys, rock meet bottom. You know, that's that's a terrible preseason ranking. And look, I was wrong about them. Everybody was wrong about them. I get it that you're going to miss. But, like, look, they shouldn't have been 10. They shouldn't have been. And you avoid this issue. Like you said, like, does Boston College have a top 10 win? Does, does Georgia Tech have a top 10 win? Like, what are we doing here? Florida State may win two games this year. So Florida I, State was a top 10 team at the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm so tired of here. I don't care. Like, but Georgia, right? I mean, Georgia Tech, they beat a top 10 team. Yeah, that's, sure. I mean, you know. And bad. that's the stupidity behind it. Yeah. So I, I'm with you. The same thing in the NFL goes on. You hear about all these teams that are good, this and that. They're going to be great. And then, like, right, the big shocker, like the New Orleans Saints are 2-0. and Someone tell me who picked them to be 2-0 and and leading their division right now. Anybody? Not I. Right right behind them is the Bucks And the Falcons, who are the hot pick, right, they're 1-1. They're one and one. They had a nice victory last night. Uh, did you see? I, I don't know if you were up that late. It's midnight. Kirk Cousins is a beautiful – Two minute drive to win the game, and I had the Manning podcast on or the Manning oh, yeah. broadcast. Dude, if you don't watch that, it's them and uh Matt Ryan was on with them at this time. They got and they're hyped. like they're like, all right, two minute drill. Like, here's the big thing. You want the first play to be positive and you need one explosive. First play, 10 yard dig over the middle, next play, explosive. And they're like, here it is. They're, they're gonna score. <laughs> and I was just yep. like, only Peyton Manning it, combined with Matt Ryan and Eli basically tell you what's going to happen before it happens like look here's exactly the perfect two minute drive and i swear as they were saying it kirk cousins is just executing it to a t it was unbelievable just what a drive you put together to 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 march them down and win that was incredible yeah and you know right it all comes off the uh the drop pass by saquon on like the same goal line play i know this wasn't on the goal line but defense is when are we gonna just guard the left flat on third fourth and short and goal line like there are coverages out there where the corner sits and everyone else slides the coverage like offenses are going to our you know you're right our left flat like the chiefs won the super bowl on it the uh philly scored earlier on that play or i think saquon was marked down on the one but they basically scored earlier on they came back to it on fourth and one like or third and one or whatever it was it's like guys they're gonna do that so Kind of drive me nuts. But again, I think back to our point, like, you know, preseason polls, there's all these teams and everybody's telling you how great or how bad someone's going to be. And then you look up at it and you're like, wow, those guys were completely wrong. Right. I heard about how bad the Buffalo Bills were going to be. Right. They lost Stefan Diggs and they lost Gabe Davis and all this stuff. And they're, they're two and oh, guys. And guess what? They got the Jags. So they're probably going to be three and oh, um, <laughs> which hurts my heart to say. But, you know, it is what it is. And so these uh, these preseason polls are killing me. Um Matt, do you want to see the worst alignment of the weekend? Let's do it. All right. Just if you're listening, I have not shown Matt this. Um, if you want to see it, I'm I'm literally pulling it from Coach Vass's Twitter. And he retweeted it from another guy uh, named Justin Whitlock. But Matt, can you see the screen? Oh, yeah. So the Saints are in 12 we're, personnel. We're a little out gapped here. The, the Cowboys are in a 4-3. I, I guess technically you could say it's 7-on-7 seven seven here, but <laughs> it is... They are in a two eye and a nine and a three and a nine and a couple backers in the middle and a walk down safety. I mean, classic over front, right? (laughs) Except you're missing somebody. I don't know if you play nines like that, but yeah. (laughs) So it's, it's not a crazy thing. That's, that's what I like to call my alignment of the week. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, the clip that follows this is uh, the saints gashing them for a huge run. So it uh, goes to show you, even at the, uh, you know, everyone's moving back to 11 and 12 personnel, right? We've seen that great swing back into the heavier sets, if you will. And I think people are struggling to adjust back to it, right? Everyone wants to be a nickel all the time. There's not as much base set. What do you do in these situations? And I think here's a here's a primary piece right here. Kyle, in our unpublished episode last week, I, I talked about the, how the NFL, they're running such wide nines in that over front. Yeah. There's just no adjustment here at all to a double tight set. I know. These are that's where they've been playing their I I swear if you take those tight ends off the field, they'd still be playing those wide nines there. Someone I mean, yeah, someone's gotta be in a six in my mind, but I mean I get it. I'm not an NFL yeah. DC. I get it. I hindsight's twenty twenty and I can second guess and I can be a you know, a coach from the couch over here, but good lord, like 
I don't love that alignment at all. Uh, so that's a tough one. So there, there's my alignment of the day. Um, so Matt, a, a big piece of what I've seen, right? Dan Casey is, I, I, however you want to call it, right? The godfather of offensive plays on Twitter, right? The guy said like articles written about him, everything. So lately he's been talking about a play. Um, this is his name for it. It's GH counter bluff reverse. All right. And okay. so I'm going to pull it up and, and I watched it from Dan Casey and I was like, Hey, I, I've seen that some on, on film. And so I was like, as I'm looking at, it, I'm like, let me go ahead and make a cut up of it. All right. So here it is. Let me go all the way back here to the beginning of the cut up. So here's the dolphins running it. All right. And we're going to see this several times. So the dolphins are running it right here. So again, they're doing it with orbit motion, but they start like they're running counter. And then that H is going to flip back out and get on the edge there for the reverse. Get back on that again. Go back to the beginning. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Where'd we get the puller from? Uh, so the puller comes from the front side. He's going to pull like they're going counter backside. And then the guy, the H is actually going to turn around and reverse back out. The other puller. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The other puller is the, the, the center in this case. Center. The center does. Yeah. So I've seen a couple different ways here. The center pulls. Sometimes the center will wander downfield and out to the edge. So he'll do both things. I've seen it both ways, but this is kind of the staple play I've seen in the NFL. And so Dan Casey's talked about how everyone's running. He's even got college film on it, but we'll see. All right, here's the angle where you can actually see the center. Sorry, I probably should have given this to you, Matt. You're good. But again, right there, I mean, it's such a great misdirection play. And to be honest with you, I haven't seen a team really lose yards on it yet. Well, so um, many teams are, are running, you know, GH counter. Yeah. As, as we talked about in the unreleased episode, the, that, uh, that, so much you got to react to it. Yeah. And so here we are. Same game. Here's Buffalo. They're going to come back and run the same thing. Uh, you know, a little, everyone does their own little different presentation, but here it is this time it's TH, right? Not GH, but TH, the tackle is going to pull this time, but still the same thing. The H is the bluff guy coming back and there's the reverse right there. I'll give you the back shot of it. Um, but we can see the shift here. Obviously everyone's going to dress it up and do different things here. And now 73 is going to pull in, in the Buffalo ran a lot of dart in this game. So they made it almost look like, I know this is, you know, still a counter bluff, but that tackle pulled a lot. So I'm, I assume that's why they did it here and boom, there it goes. And again, none of these are like game breakers, but I really haven't seen anybody lose too many yards on it. I mean, here, I guess Buffalo doesn't get more than a couple yards, but I haven't, I, you know, I've yet to see anyone get tackled for like a four yard loss on this. Yeah. Here we go. Oakland, uh, LA chargers. We're going to get the same style, GH. This time it's out of under, and they're flipping it to the wide receiver, going the other direction. It's Las Vegas, by the way. Oh, sorry. Did I call him Oakland? Yeah, there we are. I'm just – you know Oakland, what it is? LA, you, you know what it is? City, but... I'm going to tell you this right now. I, I'm watching – I'm re-watching Ballers on Netflix, and it's with, you know, with The Rock and everything when they're on HBO. Yeah. And they're talking about the Oakland and, and Las Vegas transition right now, so I'm screwing it up. So here's the back shot to it. This time we're going to present it out of under. Same thing. We're going to have that GH or GY pull. He's going to reverse back out. Boom. There goes the wide receiver and they're out on the edge. Right. And the, you know, chargers do a really good job of running the alley here. Um, but you can see it multiple times. And then guess what? The chargers are going to come back and run it back to them. So again, the chargers are going to do the same thing. We're going to see that GH right there. And look, look, even this, like the Raiders sniff this out. They're there. This is a tackle for loss, except it's not. And it goes for a nice little gain for the Chargers. So, I mean, Matt, you're, you're an O-line guy. I know we talk about this. This has become the hot, trendy play of the year. You know, what do you think about it? I think it's easy to install off of your, your counter play. I think it's a fun, fun way to get to a reverse. Yeah. I always liked having, you know, you, when you're building your offense, you talk about protecting the, your plays. And when you protect your plays, you protect your players. Yeah. Um, so you always want um, some sort of counter off a of base play. I know counter is a play, right? Counter is your base play. You need the counter off the you counter. You want some, you got to have a counter off the counter. So here's <laughs> your counter off counter that ends up being a reverse, you know, and having a play action, having a counter, having a screen off of it, you yeah. know, that's what protects that base play. And it, it helps protect your players because it, it, it makes that defense 
throttle down a little bit and think about things. Yeah. And you know, so many people, I had this conversation the other day with the coach, you know, obviously traditional football, there's play action. Now there's RPO, but now to me, I am this is what I call them. I call them run action passes where people are running like the counter of the power scheme and throwing off, you know, they, they're going to pull a guy and, and then pass protect basically that I've kind of, you know, and again, I didn't create this. I heard it from someone else, but I like the term is like, Hey, that's a run action, right? We are literally getting counter or power or zone run action. And then they're throwing the ball off that. And I think that's another way to protect it, right? It, it's different than traditional drop back. It's different from play action, right? It's run action. Um, sorry, my daughter's running in the background here. So if you see her, she's got a hat on. Uh, Armani Perez uh, from the Seahawks. Shout out to you, man, for giving uh, me that hat that my daughter's wearing right now. So thanks for sending that down to me. Um, so moving on, kind of our next piece. All right, Matt, I'm going to give you a head coach situation. You are leading 13-12 on the number one team in the country at home, 309 left, and you have a fourth and one situation from their 48-yard line. You going for it? I mean, I don't know. That's I, the way I see it. Everything when, in the game happens a little bit differently than on the couch. You know, uh, you know, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm the one who would definitely go for it and try to seal it. But I could see where, hey, we've held them to how many points? Well, it's not sealing it. You're down one. So, I mean, you need a point. Oh, I thought you said up one. Sorry. Uh, I apologize. You're down 13, 12. Going for it. Got to go yeah. for it. I, look, this it. is this is a real situation. I know people have been all over him. I know he's defended himself, but I feel like at times, and I could be wrong, but some coaches play to like not lose big rather than win in in my book. And I'm right. Um, you play to win the game, and I I love that quote. And I'll live and die in it. Look, I would much rather lose by fifty than one. I don't care what anyone says. People are probably like, "Coach, you're crazy." Listen, I say this all the time. When you lose by one, you're like, if we just made this play, or that play, or this play, and you lose sleep over it, and you never forget. I remember every game we lost that was tight in my entire career, probably my playing career too. Every dead last one of them, right? Remember those times that we barely lost to Seminole? When the, uh, who, who was the wide receiver? His shirt, like he got tackled by his shirt sleeve, basically, that lost the game. Uh, his undershirt got really uh, wrapped up in the DB's hand. And uh, couldn't get out of it, spun and wrapped yeah. around the DB's hand. And even after the he came down, he couldn't get his hand out. Yeah, right. Like you That's remember when he tucking in jerseys. Yeah, you remember those things. I, I never go back to a game where we lost by fifty, and I'm like, well, if we just did these hundred and five things right in this game, we would have won, right? Like we just made these thirty six plays. And so, uh, it, look, three oh nine left. He punts it, and they never get the ball back. Like. You're at home, and even if you're on the road, like, look, you're the underdog. You got nothing to lose at that point. I think you go for it. I Like, understand who you are, right? Yeah. I'm not knocking on – look, I'm not the head coach of Kentucky. I can never be at that level. No one wants to hire me to be a Pop Warner coach right now. But, look, if I, if I am the head coach of Kentucky, I'm going, well, we're not Georgia. Let's go ahead and do this. Let's let's get after it. So, you know, I'd, I'd rather see us celebrating on the sideline at the end of the game than being like – you know, what is someone going to do? Rip you for being too aggressive? Like, who cares? Let's go in the game. So, go in. It, you know, and it goes back and forth. And, and and I am not, by the way, if you're listening, I'm not an analytics guy. I, I don't think that you look at that chart and you get super aggressive because the chart says so. I believe it's somewhere between that chart and your feel for the game. Because you guys know as well as everyone else, the chart may say go for it, but all night you may not have been able to block the three tech. Like, you're not going to run the ball, right? You know, like, we're not going to run B gap if we can't get that guy. So, those charts are a little overrated at times, but all right, Matt, best game of the week. What was the best game you watched this week? Doesn't have to be the best game that actually was. What's the best game you saw? I'm going to be honest. There wasn't a, <laughs> wasn't a whole lot that knocked my socks off this week. Um, I caught a lot of the uh, Utah game. Yeah. You know, uh, I thought that, that was decent there. I, I just, I don't know. I thought it was a really kind of, kind of ho-hum weekend for college football. Yeah, I think there was one. It didn't happen in the weekend. It happened right before. Uh, Arizona State, Texas State was a good game. Uh, Kenny Dellingham, boy, he got a little mad. They, they like, put a second back on the clock, and he was like, I'm just here so I won't get fined after. It was pretty funny. Oh, yeah. Um, I thought that was a pretty good game all in all. And then, you know, I thought the South Carolina-LSU game was was exciting. 
Uh, you know, South Carolina went big and LSU came back. And, you know, speaking of that, Matt, at the, at the end of the South Carolina LSU game, right? LSU's trying to drive to throw a touchdown. He throws a pick. It's not a good pick. Guys going the other way for 100 yards. The all American, what, what is going to be the all American freshman DN for South Carolina? That kid's, that kid's unbelievable. Stud. Stud. The quarterback throws a pick, stops for a second sees the returner starts to run towards the returner with his eyes on the returner. And that DN comes back and blocks him. And I'd be honest, it wasn't that vicious of a block. The kid kind of flops too. It was a good block. I mean, that, don't get me wrong. That kid would send me flying, but I'm not as big as, you know, the quarterback for LSU. And I believe I I'm watching at the time. They could never really figure it out that they, you know, regardless, they either called a roughing, or uh, sorry, an unnecessary roughness, or uh, I believe somebody tried to tell me that they threw a roughing the passer on that one. And I just can't believe, even if they called unnecessary roughness or whatever you want to call it, like the only thing I could legitimately hear them call right there is an illegal crackback block, which I don't think it was either because he leads with his hands. It's not, you know, a blindside shot or anything like that's the worst call of the weekend. It lost a yeah, game he, for them. <laughs> it, he clearly led with his hands. He wasn't doing anything like super forceful. He's just coming through the guy with his hands. You know, I I, I didn't see anything wrong with it at all. And that, that was a, that was a game changer. Absolutely. Yeah. And I tell you what, look, just as a former defensive back, as a defensive coach, like you just took a hundred and something yard pick six away from somebody. That's like just getting kicked right in the dick. I'm sorry. <laughs> that is the and, greatest moment, probably going to be the greatest moment of that kid's career. Cause like, you just don't get an opportunity to do that. Right. He may play yeah. in the NFL. Who knows? He may, you know, if he wins a Super Bowl, that'll be the greatest moment. But you get what I'm saying? Like, you're never going to have a play quite like that again. And and it kind of got robbed from him. And I, I hate that. Um, you can't speak- get that back. Kyle, Kyle hang on. I, I screwed up. I don't know what I was even thinking. The UCF uh, comeback. Oh, that's on Saturday right. Saturday night. The UCF. You down, are a UCF guy. They were down at infinity that? from what I remember. Oh, it was like 28-7 or something like that. I thought it was over. Um, but yeah, their, their comeback was absolutely insane. KJ Jefferson actually showed up and, and <laughs> played football, uh, which we didn't know if he could do or not. Um, RJ Harvey was being RJ Harvey and just took over as a, as a man in the game. And, um, you know, you, you watch, what was really interesting watching that was seeing Ted Roof change the defense from the first half to the second half, make adjustments. Something that, you know, we hadn't seen a lot in defensive coordinators at UCF come out and make adjustments and yeah. um, try, try to seal off that game. But that was a that was a fun win for Knights fans. Yeah. So, I mean, there there's some good games out there. I think what happens is a lot of people go and watch the marquee games and they don't always get to watch the other games. And look, I don't blame them. A lot of our audience, if you're listening, you're probably a high school football coach. I don't blame you for only watching the marquee games. You just played the night before. You're trying to break down film. You got to spend time with your family and you're probably having to show up Sunday morning to, to do film review and study and all that. So I get only watch the marquee games. That's the great thing about me and Matt is uh, we get to sit around and watch all of them. All right. So uh, <laughs> we didn't quite get to all of them this weekend, but we will at some point. So it's been pretty good. Matt, I'm going to talk about one other crack back block. I don't know if you saw it. Did you see the Quentin Nelson one for the Colts, the lineman? No, 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 no I didn't see it. <laughs> I don't have this clip on me. I'm going to send it to you. He, it's like a rollout and he has the guy, the D lineman dead to rights, like a murder path. And he just jogs up to him with his hands out like this and just shoves. And the guy, I mean, because the guy's just not even paying attention, the guy immediately just goes down, but it is like the most like, Hey bro, I could have, I could have murdered you. Like, I just assume that's what he said, but the guy goes down. It's still a, a good block. It seals it off. The guy actually like flops on, right on over. I don't think he flopped. I think he's just not looking. So he just went right down right away. And you can just tell that that guy was probably like, I could have gotten murdered and he just let me off. It is the, <laughs> it's so weird. Like, cause I don't want to call it a soft play. Cause that's not a soft alignment right there. That guy would probably rip your face off. But I think in the moment he's just like, look, if I hit this guy too hard, I'm going to get a penalty. And it's just one yeah. of those like, hey, I'm going to be really smart right here. It's like the guy who blocks on a punt return by sticking his hands up, right? And like going like this, you know, it's like one of those. So I'll find the clip and send it to you. If you're out there listening, go go look up the clip. It is absolutely hysterical. Um, Look, you talked about KJ Jefferson showing up. You know, one guy that's not showed up in my life right now is DJ Unglialea. 
however I say it, DJU, in the Seminoles, right? They're 0-3, Matt. And I don't really want to focus too much on the Seminoles because I talk too much about them. But from a head coaching perspective, what do you do when the wheels come off right away like that? You come out, you're 0-3, nothing's going right. You know, at this point, you know, I, and Mike Norvell's going to do what Mike Norvell does, but we're going to play a hypothetical game. If you're the head coach at Florida State, what do you do moving on from here? Well, if the wheels come off, you got to find new wheels. <laughs> that's, you know, that's actually a good analogy. Get down the road. Only one way to get down the road. So if those wheels are coming off, it's time to replace them with new wheels and and, and get back on the road and, and get the season going. Um, I mean, to me, that's the only answer. You know, is is this all DJ's fault? I don't think so. No, I, I I'll, I'll be the first to say it's not. All over the place. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you would have expected a better run game out of Florida State. You would have expected a better run defense with that defensive line they have. And, and, and it's just not meshing together. Like they have all these – it's like they have all these parts and pieces and, you know, that the, the, where, you know, the sum of all the parts should be this great thing, but yep. that, that the sum of all the parts is not equaling all the parts, you know, it's, it's now the whole is not equaling the sum of the parts. So there's, there's an issue there. There's a disconnect. And um, obviously the, the Florida state coaching staff did not do a good job in the off season, getting everybody on the same page because, it, there's it, it, there's too many mental mistakes happening, and, and when when you have all those mental mistakes, uh, physical physical mistakes follow and and compound. Yeah, I mean it really is what it is, and I'm not going to get too far into it as far as this or that. But I think if I'm a coach in that situation, right, you got to start playing the young guys at this point. You know, you're 0 three. For all intents and purposes, the season's over. I'm not saying you don't try. You don't try to win six games, get bowl eligible. There's a possibility of doing that. I hope that happens. But I think at this point, you know, you, you look at some of those guys, those older guys, and, you know, maybe a TJU and say, hey, thank you, but we're going to go ahead and move on to the next guy. And because you have two young four star quarterbacks, and you got to figure out which guy's the, the leader of this team for the next three years. You got to figure out, you know, out of these, you know, you have a bunch of young kids, you know, some young four star DBs and guys like this. And I think you got to play those guys because I think if you're bad and you don't play your young, talented guys, you're going to lose your young, talented guys. Right. Because what's their incentive? Like, look, if you are on the national title path and they don't play, it's, it's OK. I'll wait my turn. Right. Most guys, some guys, whatever. I know NIL is different. But if you're bad, you know, if you're two and 10 and they don't get on the field, they're like, well, they, they don't want to play me. Right. Because these guys are four and five stars, not like they're, you know, a walk on. And so that's my thing. I think you have to find a way to get some of these young guys on the field. A, it may give you a burst of energy and may help you win games. So that would be awesome. But B, I, you have to understand you have a program and it's a long term thing. Like you can't lose some of your talent. So you can't lose all this year plus lose your talent. And you know, as well as I know, if you go two and 10 or three, whatever you want to say, uh, a subpar, a non bowl eligible thing, your recruiting suffers no matter who you are. So if you lose your recruits from last year to transfer and your recruiting suffers for the next year, you got problems. So I think play the young guys and at least you're showing recruits and other people like, Hey, if you come in here, you're going to play like, look, we're, yeah. we don't care. We're going to play you. So, you know, I'm not the head coach of Florida state. I don't talk to anybody on the Florida state staff anymore. I'm not telling anyone what to do. We're just talking about hypothetical scenario. This could be anybody that's 0-3, right? You know, at the high school level, I, I, it's a little different because I think you want to play your seniors because they earned it and stuff like that. But I think if you're 0-3, 0-5, 0-6, it's time to start playing some of the young guys there too. I'm not saying bench all your seniors and tell them, you know, piss off and, you know, you know all that stuff because I do believe you, you own an obligation to your seniors as a high school coach. But I think that's when you're like, hey, do we let's find out some of these sophomores can play, some of these juniors, some of these guys are getting ready for next year. Um, yeah, and at minimum, <laughs> ro start rotational. You know, start yeah. rotating them in and and send your message there. <clears throat> and I've always been a big believer in packages. I think if you have young, talented kids, you know, now I don't know if I I thought I only coached one or two years under the six quarter thing, but you know, with the six quarter thing and this other stuff, that's what we have in the state of Florida. Everybody can play six quarters a week you know, find packages to get these guys on the field for a little bit to see if they can play, right? If you can give a young kid one thing to do, he can probably do it, right? I don't need my, you know, my freshman defensive back out there in every package, but we can put him out there and dime and tell him to rush the passer or, or play cover two or whatever. So, 
yeah. So it's, it's always tough when you start off, you know, you have high hopes and then you start off and then you, you just can't seem to, to win anything. And it just seems hopeless and you got to find a way to motivate. Cause that's your job, right? Everybody's looking at you. You're zero and three. Everybody's frustrated and upset. And it's like, you almost got to be, you know, like that's the great example I always talk about, Matt, you haven't watched it, but you almost got to be like Ted Lasso. You not let it bother you and be positive and just try to go day to day. And it's, it's got to be tough. God. Kyle's had a rough start to the year as a Florida State and a Jaguars fan. I am 0 and 5. I feel bad for him. It's bad. I cannot buy a win for either one of my teams. Florida State now is Cal this weekend, which is going to be tough for them because Cal's better than people thought. And Florida State obviously just isn't very good. And the Jags are going to Buffalo. So now. Well, speaking of that. I Speaking of that, we're going to get to this here in a minute. But actually, hold on. Let's get to it. And then I'm going to talk about it. Good. All right. So, Matt, I wrote down a question. Which NFL team gets their first victory this week? The first thing I wrote down was the Jags-Bills because I knew it off the top of my head. Now, as crazy as it sounds, the Jags are, like, fantastic against Josh Allen. <laughs> like, I believe they've won, like, two of their last three or three of their last four against Josh Allen. So that's that's on the board. The next one is the Ravens over the Cowboys. Broncos over the Bucks, Colts over the Bears, Titans over the Packers, Bengals over the Commanders, Giants over the Browns, Panthers over the Raiders, or Rams over the 49ers. Matt, you got to pick one of those teams. Um, it's a tough man. one. It's a tough one. Because um, there's a few good ones in there, there's, I think. There's, there's two that really stand out to me, and that's the Colts over the Bears. I think the the Colts have a great opportunity to go in there. Um you know, the, the way the Bears offense has been playing, um, I think the Colts can put up some points and, and uh, you know, they they got a good shot there. The other one that really stands out to me is Bengals over Commanders, and that's the one I'm going to go with. <laughs> that was one uh, I was thinking the, of. No, I can't go with it, though. <laughs> you can. Okay, no, I'll, not... I'll, I'll give you that one. I'll take no. the Colts. I'll take the Colts. No. Colts over okay. Bears. Go ahead. We are Bengals. Yeah, I you know – I don't think that the Bengals are as good as some people think they are, but I think they're good enough to to win a game. <laughs> I don't think the Titans, I mean, like, right, we go down this list, right? Like the Titans have had two of the funniest, like, gifts or memes the last two weeks with um, Will Levis, right? Did you see the first week when he threw the pick six and he's on the ground oh, like yeah. this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and then last week, did you see his, his interception last week? Dude, they, they, he he's, like, spinning up, around and he yeah. And then Bill Callahan, you can clearly see him. He's walking down the thing. He's like, what the F are you doing? <laughs> just, just as clear as day. You can't, you can't blame them. I, mean, I, I know they're adults. I don't care. Yeah. You can yell at adults all you want. I just, you know, going down this list, the other one that kind of sticks out is maybe the Ravens over the Cowboys. When you have Lamar Jackson, like, I just feel like he can explode in a day, especially if the Cowboys are going to align like that to 12 personnel. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think there's field. I do think the Jags can beat the Bills. I think the Jags have, have played two really close games. You're right. They're they're 0 and 2, but Hail Mary, you know, against the Browns and the Dolphins, you know, it just took a bad turn, but they still lost on last play of the game. Like, let's not act like the Dolphins went out there and dominated them. So I'm not going to pick the Jags because that always does poorly for me. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go with the, uh, the Bengals over the Commanders and you have, who'd you pick? The Colts, Colts over the Bears. Colts over the Bears. I'm putting you in yellow on this doc here. All right, last thing, man. Let's get to it. Um, we're just going to do a quick pick them this week. All right, I got these games. You ready? I'm ready. All right, Illinois at Nebraska. Give me Nebraska at home. Buddy, I am. we all know that I used to live in Nebraska. I'm a skur. I still have the gear. They're my kind of second team there. I'm with you, Nebraska all the way. People are a little mad that Dylan Riola wants to be too much like Patrick Mahomes. How do you feel about that? I mean, it's a very clear uh, copycat of what Mahomes is. It's kind, of, it's kind of cringy. <clears throat> you know, people say that, and to them, I say, "Shut up." He's an eighteen-year-old kid. He's having fun, and he's got a hero. It's not a bad hero to have in football. I hate the Chiefs. I really do. I hate Mahomes only because he's good. I don't think he's a bad person. I think all those things. I just hate the Chiefs. But you know what? That kid, he's not doing anything wrong. Right, it's a little cringy to us, but you know what? I'm also not a Division One quarterback, so they shut made, up. 
He may do a better <laughs> impression of Mahomes than Mahomes does of himself. Yeah, that's what they were saying. So I just, yeah, whatever. I, I'm, you know what, Dylan Raiola, you're not listening to this, but if you are, I got your back. I think everyone else needs to shut up. Go have fun, kid. It, good for you. All right, USC at Michigan. <clears throat> uh, I'm not impressed with Michigan. Give me USC. Yeah, I. Michigan's quarterback situation is really bad. It's yeah. just, it kind of starts and stops there. All right, Utah at Oklahoma State. The two oldest quarterbacks to ever face off each, against each other in college. I think Oklahoma State's catching fire. Give me the Cowboys. It was like I'd say it's like a combined age of forty nine, <laughs> or something like that. They're old, dude. It cracks me up. All right, you're going uh, and, Oklahoma State. Cam, yeah, Cam Rising gets hurt too much, so I'm gonna go Utah. I, okay. man, I I really like Whittingham. I just do. He's I like good. him a lot. Tennessee at Oklahoma. Uh, give me my boy, Josh Heupel. Those yeah, bowls are rolling. Buddy, that Nico kid. I, I kind of saw him a couple years ago or like a year and a half ago, and I was like, why is this kid not playing over Joe Mixon? Yeah. That's going to be one of those all-time boneheaded moves, not playing the kid earlier, right? Yeah. Hype, don't get mad at me for saying that hype. I'm sorry, but should have played him. All right, here's a tough one. Cal at Florida State. I don't even know who to pick. <laughs> You know what? Um, it's a long trip. It's a long yeah, trip. Didn't they come beat? Didn't they come beat Auburn a few weeks ago? Um, did Auburn go there? Or did they go to Auburn? They went to Auburn. I'm pretty sure and won. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's a tough game for Florida State. Give me Cal. You got Cal. All right. At Doke. <clears throat> I can't pick against them, Florida State. I know. Can't. I, I don't. That's I don't want the to. difference. This hurts. I don't want to do it. I just, I can't, I can't not pick them. I can't, I mean, they could, I'll pick them the week they're playing Clemson and the week they're playing Miami. I'll do it because I'm an idiot, but I'm, I'm a fan. All right. Good ones. NFL Texans at Vikings. I thought the Vikings really bounced back and looked good last week. Yeah. Sam Darnold coming into himself there. Beating um, up on the 49ers, man. JJ was huge, you know, All right? What do yeah. you think? I, I just with uh you know, I don't know the status of Jefferson going into this game, so give me the Texans. Texans. I'm gonna go with the Vikings. I'm gonna ride the heat. There you go. It's probably one of those hatred for the Texans things too, but gotta have fun in our pick'em, right? Chargers yeah. at Steelers. <clears throat> give me hardball. Give me that hard nosed team. Yeah, right. We talked about preseason, we talked about all this. Everyone told me the Chargers weren't going to be any good, right? He went there. He got rid of the two receivers, or they did, right? They traded him away. Everyone's like, oh, they're going to have no weapon. Like Justin Herbert, now they have no weapons for him. Now what is Justin Herbert going to do? Really good because they drafted Joe Alt. That dude is already looking like a Hall of Famer. And the Harbaugh style, he protects quarterbacks and then lets them sling it. And they've thrown it more than I thought they would. They actually have not run as many – like last game, I broke it out. They have not run as many gap schemes as I thought, Matt. That was a little shocking for me. I'm with yeah, you. I'm going Chargers. Zone. I like how the Chargers are playing on offense. I like how they're playing on defense. <clears throat> All right, Chiefs at Falcons. Falcons, huge victory last night. Chiefs, yeah. and tough, anytime tough I team try to, to beat, they get all the calls. <laughs> anytime I bet against the Chiefs, I lose. So uh, I got to go with the Chiefs. All right, I'm going with the Falcons for the upset. Just got to, I got to, I got to go against you on some of these. Yep. All right. Ravens at Cowboys. This was one of our, can they get their first win games, right? Oh, and two versus one and one. But yeah. we all know that both so, of these teams are streaky teams. The downfall of the Dallas Cowboys has already started. Their fans got one week to be happy and uh, <laughs> give me the, give me the Ravens. Give me Lamar. you got the Ravens and Lamar. I agree with you. I, I think it's really hard to see a Lamar Jackson, um, other Harbaugh Ravens go to 0-3 to start the year. Uh, right? That just It doesn't seem like it's feasible. I, I know it is, obviously, because they're 0-2. They could go 0-3, but I just – it's one of those, like, I don't want to pick this. <laughs> and, and look, the Cowboys are that weird team. One week they're going to look like juggernauts, and the next week they're going to, you know, they're going to look like a high school. It's so weird the way they do that. Um. But you never know, right? The Cowboys come out win that game by 20 because that's what they do. So, all right, that's our pick them for the week. Matt, any other closing things going into, I guess, week week four of the NFL, week th- or week four of college football, week three of the NFL? <clears throat> I got nothing for you, man. 
Um, next week when we get on with Matt, we're gonna go ahead and, and uh go back through. We we got to take a little bit of time to do this, but we want to go through every guest that we had, and we're gonna check in and see how they're doing on their football season. Right. A, a lot of good coaches out there that we've talked to that have had, you know, football seasons now, what, four weeks in in high school. A um, lot going on. We want to see it. Right. We had just a, a you know, couple ones that, that we've talked to that have started off rocky. One of them started out really rocky here in town, but then they just beat their rival for the first time in a decade to win their first game. So big win for them. If you listen to us and you're in Jacksonville, you know who I'm talking about. But we'll talk about that next week. But you know, coaches, we do want to highlight um, all the hard work that you've done. Obviously, you came on here and talked to other coaches for us, so we definitely want to highlight you if you're having a great year. So we'll do that next week. We'll give all those coaches a shout-out and all that good stuff. Anything else, Matt? No, that'll be great, and great to try to get those coaches back on and reconnect with them at some point. Yeah, it'd be fantastic. So, coaches, again, we're, we're four weeks through. It's another, what, seven, eight weeks before me and Matt could start bothering you again and getting you back on the podcast. So enjoy your seven weeks and not being annoyed by these two knuckleheads. Um, so anyways, uh, thank you for tuning in guys. We appreciate having you tonight again, check out all of our channels, check out our YouTube. It's got uh, full game cutups, check out our TikTok for clips, check out boardrill.com for, um, in-depth written articles, uh, for Kyle and Matt signing off. We will see you next week. Mm-hmm.